Some people go so far to avoid tracking online that they exclusively use GNU IceCat or the Tor browser, and they block all JavaScript on all web pages. But several InfoSec researchers have discovered that it's actually possible to track people online without any JavaScript at all. Now, why does this matter? Most of the internet is already dependent on JavaScript. Uh, you pretty much can't use any social media or go to any video sites, uh, at least not any that aren't doing pure HTML5 video without running some kind of JavaScript. Now, JavaScript isn't something that is inherently evil. In fact, some of the fingerprinting capabilities themselves can actually be useful. Like for example, if you're trying to search for some type of software to download, it's usually pretty helpful for the web page to fingerprint uh, what type of OS you're running and automatically take you to that download page. Like if you're a Windows user searching for Firefox, you don't want to get brought to the Mac page for downloading Firefox. Or if you were trying to visit a blog or some website where you had to look at stuff like pictures or whatever, you want to have your browser or you want to have that web page automatically get formatted for whatever device you're on. Like you want to get the mobile version of that page if you're on mobile. You want to get the desktop version of that page if you're on the desktop. So. This stuff can be useful, but things start getting spooky when the owners of websites start using the data that they're getting from you to track you. Um, you know, because if they combine your IP and regional information with all of the information that JavaScript can detect, like hardware, OS, and browser info, they end up with a unique identifier for you. And then the site just needs to look for this unique identifier to detect if you visited a web page or not. Now, maybe you're one of the people that says, I don't really care if I'm being tracked and companies and the government, they, you know, they can know everything that I do online. But this tracking is being used for more than just tracking. Oftentimes, these unique identifiers are used to implement things like price discrimination. All right, so this is actually one of the common uh, selling points for a VPN, right? Because a website can determine roughly what city you're in just based off of your IP address. And it's actually quite common for hotels and flights to be priced higher for individuals that are living in wealthier regions than poorer ones. Um, I guess the idea is that they assume if you live in New York or Boston that you have a lot of money and if you're in West Virginia or some other poor place then you're going to be poor. The same could probably be done with devices, say if somebody's using a MacBook or an iPhone or they detect that you have an expensive GPU or CPU in your rig, then they might just assume that you have a lot more money, but I have yet to see this particular kind of price discrimination fingerprinting done in the wild. Uh, now, there are ways to mitigate this type of stuff. Of course, you can just change your IP with a VPN. Everybody knows that thanks to how heavily VPNs get shilled. Uh, and that's pretty much all that the mainstream VPNs are good for, by the way. And you can block most, if not all, JavaScript by, again, using highly secure spyware-free browsers like Tor or GNU IceCat. Um, these are the browsers of choice for somebody who obviously values not being tracked and values their privacy even more than being able to go to all the shiny new web pages that all the kids go to. But even if you've rejected modernity and you've decided to only use web pages that are just you know basic static HTML and CSS web pages, there's still a possibility that tracking can be done with this side channel attack that's described in this PDF. I'll leave a link to it in the description. And since this is a side channel attack, it doesn't really matter what type of browser you're using. Um, you know, it doesn't matter what script block script blockers you're using, because again, it is possible to do this without any JavaScript. And it doesn't even matter what architecture you're on. This can be done on mobile, you know, Snapdragon processors, this can be done on a Ryzen desktop or a MacBook with the new ARM chips, it really doesn't matter. Um, so this is a cache-based side channel attack. Um, and with that, that is possible to do it with HTML and CSS alone, but there's different 
Um, there's different types that they tested here. Basically, they started progressively using less and less JavaScript because everybody knows that you can do this type of stuff with JavaScript. And this works similarly to the meltdown inspector attacks uh, that you probably heard about years ago. Um, those allow an attacker to leak memory contents of other applications that were running on your operating system. So essentially what's going on with these is an attacker is doing a cache occupancy attack to be able to read from your cache whatever webs what other websites you are browsing. So it starts by you going to a website that is malicious and it starts by including in its CSS an element from another domain which they also control uh, and that's going to force a DNS resolution. So then the malicious DNS server is going to log the time that you made that DNS request. And while that's going on, the malicious website that you visited can have an HTML page that evokes a string search. And it's usually gonna be something like a class name that has a very, very long string name, like two million characters, because the idea is that the attack, the attacker wants to fill the entire cache with just nonsense data so that they can see how, how long it takes to probe your entire cache. Then once this is completed, another DNS request is going to be made to the attacker server. So they're basically using the DNS server like a stopwatch to time how long that takes. And this process will repeat over and over again um, so it's all happening in the background because, again, you could do this with just HTML and CSS. Uh, I know I said that a bunch of times. Now, if you go to visit another website in another tab, because when you open a browser, you're probably not just using one tab, that data is not really separated, at least as far as the cache is concerned. So in normal circumstances, an attacker or whoever owns a website wouldn't be aware of any other sites that you open. but when they are occupying all of your cache, they can tell if you open another site because some of those memory locations are going to flush out the junk data of that malicious, that the malicious website had in it. And they will see what areas of the cache have data from the other tab in them. And if you can see what areas of the cache are being occupied by that other website, uh, or really any process or program, you can start to infer what is going on, what it's doing, uh, is it encrypting or decrypting data, so on and so forth. Now, the test that was done in this paper was to have the victim machine visit each of Alexa's top 100 sites 100 times, so essentially 10K site visits, and the attacker had to guess from doing this attack and reading the cache access, uh, success and failure rates, which website the victim was going to. And the attacker knew in advance that the scope was limited to those 100 sites. So it's really kind of a controlled test. Um, but with this, they were able to guess right 61% of the time. And there was another kind of more real world test that they did too, where they explained or they expanded the short list of sites to like 5,000 traces of different sites that they had to compare to, and they got a 45% accuracy. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> this is obviously a pretty spooky thing that can happen. So let's talk about how to mitigate it. So, you know, just because fingerprinting is possible um, without JavaScript doesn't actually mean it's gonna be common. It's much easier and you get much more accurate results with using JavaScript to do this versus the CSS and HTML alone. So it's not going to be that common. Um, and the most, the obvious solution is to really just not go to sites that are doing this, right? Stick to sites that you trust. Um, I'm gonna also guess that if you're using GNU, IceCat or Tor, uh, very heavily, you might be experienced with inspecting the element of websites so that you can actually see what's going on on them, you know, what is being loaded or what they're trying to load. Uh, so I guess you could try to do that to see if anything funky is going on. Like if it's a really simple website uh, that doesn't have any JavaScript running, most likely the code of it is going to be fairly simple unless it's just really crummily designed and you might not even want to use that site because of that anyway. 
Um, but yeah, you can just take a look at some things. I guess it's not very practical, uh, but those are some ways that you can deal with it.